that there are no onlookers, there are no spectators, that somehow we are all engaged in this. We have to help parish councils see that while they've got specific responsibilities, or, or even the parish priest has got to see, while that person may have, spe well, has specific responsibilities, they don't own the right to all the dreams and visions. They are part of the body that dreams and has visions. And, w and we have to allow that. We've, we, for the most part, we who occupy the pews have forced the clergy and the councils into those positions by abdicating our responsibility and choosing to be spectators. Now, you're not here because you're a spectator, obviously. But many people in the congregations really have faithful as they are and they love the worship and they love the church they worship in and all sorts of good things but there's a sense in which the ownership is somewhere else the decision making somewhere else somehow or other it seems to me that if God is wanting us to do things I presume there must be the resources I don't I can't imagine that <coughs> God calls us to do something that's undoable. Um, that seems to me it would be a bit unfair. So we have to wrestle with this business of we can catch a glimpse of things that we could do but we seem to be held back. And that's what I want to have you reflect upon and think about. And I'm depending really on your taking that kind of question back into the congregation. The picture of the church as a pyramid is not acceptable because it's not scriptural. There, there is no pyramid in the church. We, we've created it. Um, some, of, some of us have encouraged it. Others have allowed it. But it's there. A picture that this is the, the church. And at the, at the top is the bishop. And underneath are all these other characters. And then down at the bottom are the lay people. And I've said to the clergy, it's painful sitting on a point. <laughs> and then at the bottom the, the people are carrying all the load the whole burden at the bottom there and apparently the clergy are getting a free ride up here but the lay people are carrying all the burden and the bishop is in the painful position of governing it all and, and that contradicts scripture whether we like it or not, that's not what you find in Scripture. You find a picture in Scripture, actually, I've exaggerated a bit, because I've drawn the picture of the church that I find in Ephesians as a wheel. Now, in my misspent youth, I used to fix bicycles. That was one of the, my jobs, to make, put bicycles together. And I used to get a rim, the wheel, get a rim, and then I get, well, the sides of, I used to work on, 42 spokes and a hub. And I had to gradually build the, 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 the wheel by putting key spokes in until the hub was central and then put the rest of them in. And then I had to adjust every single spoke um, constantly until eventually they were all the same tension and that when I would spin the wheel on the hub it would not wobble back and forth like that, it would be run through. And if I had over tightened one of the hub, one of the spokes, it would, it would go around, it would go mm, 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 or sometimes mm, 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 mm. <laughs> and I had to keep going until it was and at that point it was running as it was meant to run, with every part playing its part so that the thing worked properly. And do you see the image? I, I sometimes say to people, what, what do you think is the most important part of the wheel? And they say, oh, the hub. Have you ever seen a hub with no rim? <laughs> it makes for painful riding. Oh, well, sorry, it, it's the spokes. Oh, I see, so you have a hub and a, a rim, but no spokes. Well, perhaps the rim is the most important. Yeah, but if there are no spokes and no hub, every part is absolutely essential 
Each one has a different job to do, but not one is more important than another. That is a picture of the church. But we, we cannot, as stewards, assume that we can say this is our territory and we're going to not only survive in it, but we're going to preserve everything that ever was. Uh, not and be stewards. Not and recognize it's all entrusted. Not and recognize that we're meant to do something and God is meant to find some joy in it and some benefit in it. The, the survivalist, well, t let's put it this way. The determination to survive is suicidal. Who, who first said that? Well, I did. <laughs> Didn't you hear me? <laughs> now, who, who, Jesus said, if you would save your life, you'll lose it. That's, that's exactly what he meant. If you, if you clutch hold of what you've got as, and, and are determined to survive, if that's your focus, you'll lose it. That's suicidal. If you're prepared to let go of that and get on with the business of being stewards, you'll save it, says Jesus. Let's make no mistake about it. We've got to help the people of God in your parish, all of them, to discover the joy of being liberated from survivalism. Because the survivalists will not survive. The people who are determined to hold on to what they've got and what used to be, they won't hold on to what they've got and used to be. You see, it, it's one of those things. If, if that's your focus, it doesn't work. Until we start recognizing that this is where it all starts, we're just going to continue in that pattern that says, well, let's hope we survive another year. And we, we have to start choosing our officers with that in mind. Do they, do they understand that this is the, this, is, this is the bottom line in relation to everything we have and everything we are? This is really where it all starts. And... and you, you have to take that word home. It'll be a popular word if you turn up at the parish council meeting and, and tell them that they should all have been here. And uh, when they drum you out, blame me. But <laughs> seriously, if, if, we're going to, if we're going to get on this together, then the leadership and, the, and, and all of us have to be up to our ears in it. This is... This is this is the work of the church. I've got a coffee mug that was given to me at a stewardship conference which says stewardship is the work of the church, not just one of the programs that we run. There really is nothing else. And I'm not saying there's nothing else but going around getting pledges. There's nothing else but recognizing who we are. But it's, it's vital. It, it's absolutely imperative we take hold of who we are. We can't go on assuming that somehow we own it all and that we'll give back a bit. We can't keep on talking about being generous to God. We can't keep talking about uh, we ought to give God 10%. God says 100% belongs to me. What do you mean give me 10%? It's all mine. Now let's talk about 100%. Don't talk about 10, 10, 10 or whatever that slogan is. doesn't work. Talk about hundred, hundred, hundred. Just as we say at every Eucharist, all things, you know the words, don't you? All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own. Not of my own, but of thine own have we given you. It really comes down to that business of what are we doing for God out there where God lives and works. When Jesus rose, the message to the disciples is an interesting one. 
he said the message to them was that they were to go to Galilee and that there they would see him. And I wondered why. I thought, why not where they were in Jerusalem? Then I remembered that that's where all the action took place. That's where all the, most of the healings took place. That's where feedings took place. That's where all sorts of uh, activities Jesus engaged in, in reaching out to people. Jesus said, if you want to see me, you can't stay in the upper room. You've got to get out where I am. And that's where I am. I'm back in Galilee. And it seems to me we've got to discover all over again that we can't stay in the upper room, even at this level. It's, only, it's up three stairs, so this is the upper room. We can't stay in the upper room. If we really want to see him, we've got to be out where, where he is working. There's a different purpose in coming here. And that's not simply seeing Jesus. There's a text carved in wood on the, in the pulpit of St. James Cathedral in Toronto. Um, it terrifies the life out of every preacher because as soon as you get into the pulpit, you see these carved words and it says, Sir, we would see Jesus. You think, oh, I wish I'd prepared a better sermon. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure it's true. We do expect to see Jesus, but... He is not here. He is risen. And if you want to see him, you go to Galilee. You go to where the work is. You go to where the needs are. You go to where the hungry are. You go to where the hurting are. Because that's where he is. Now maybe we've got to start thinking all over again. Um, maybe we've got to stop calling this the house of God. Um, we can't box God in in that way. Maybe we've got to start thinking differently. And that's not easy. That's not easy. We've been taught not to think differently.